Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much to all attendees for participating in this FIDUI International Symposium. I would like to thank, first of all, the organization of the eight public universities in Catalonia for all the work they do through their uh, institutes of education science or their teaching support units. I also would like to mention the videos that you can find on the uh, YouTube FIDUI channel. The president of ACUP, uh, Professor Maria Jose Figueras, and rector of the uh, Universitat Rubí i Virgili, and the secretary of universities and research of the government of Catalonia, Professor Francesc Xavier Grau. You, will, you can find the two uh, videos in our uh, YouTube uh, channel. Let me first introduce in a couple of minutes the uh, 11th FIDUI International Symposium that is entitled High Education in the Knowledge Society Challenges and high, of Hybrid Models. As you already know, we will have two sessions, today the first one and tomorrow the second. Today we will have a conference by Professor Peter Matheson from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, UK. And tomorrow, at the same time as today, there will be a dialogue about the evolution of the student-teacher binomial in the new context with two professors, Linda Castañeda from the Universidad de Murcia and Hugo Pardo from Outliers School, which will be moderated by uh, Professor Josep Joan Moreso from the Catalan University Quality Assurance Agency. Uh, let me introduce the session of today. The title of the conference of Professor Matheson is Alternative Models to Address a Hybrid University System. Uh, let's mention that the uh, his presentation, of course, his conference will be in English, but you can choose uh, to uh, listen directly to English or you can uh, uh, listen with translation into Spanish. Uh, the keynote will last or more or less around 35, 40 minutes from Professor Matheson. And then we will have around, let's say, uh, let's around uh, half an hour for question time and, uh, and, and, and comments from all the attendees. So you can send questions through the platform symposium during the conference to Professor Matheson. We will try to uh, get them and uh, select some of the, of the uh, comments or questions. So that's the uh, simplest uh, program for today. Um, uh, let me lately introduce the, the, uh, the speaker, Professor Peter Matheson. Professor Matheson, thank you so much for being here with us. Professor Matheson is uh, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh since February 2018, if I'm not wrong. He was formerly President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. And he has uh, been Professor of Renal Medicine at the University of Bristol, Honorary Consultant Nephrologist at the North Bristol NIH's, NIH's Trust, Head of the University Department of Clinical Science at North Bristol, Director of Research and Development for the North Bristol NIH's Trust, and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Bristol. Uh, again, thank you so much, Professor Matheson. Uh, as, as you know, you will have around 35, 40 minutes of, for your speech. Thank you so much, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Josep. I'll, um, I'll try and speak uh, slowly because I know that uh, you have simultaneous translation. Uh, and I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak in English because my Spanish is not good. Um, and uh, I would need uh, a lot of assistance if I was going to try and speak in Spanish. But um, buenos tardes, everybody. Thank you very much to the organizers for uh, the invitation uh, uh, to contribute to your conference. 
I'm sorry that I can't do it in person in present circumstances. I would love an excuse to visit Barcelona again. Uh, I send you greetings from Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. The picture mm -hmm. on my first slide is of Old College, which is one of the oldest buildings in the university. My office in the university is towards the left-hand side of that slide, but I haven't been able to go to my office for about three months now. So uh, like mm -hmm. everybody else, uh, coronavirus has affected my way of working. But the University of Edinburgh is uh, a proud, internationally-minded university. Uh, and what I hope to illustrate to you in the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes is the fact that we have some thoughts about what we mean by hybrid education and by a hybrid university. And some of these things predate coronavirus. We were, we were making steps to try and provide hybrid models of education and uh, university experience even before coronavirus. And I have some colleagues here who are experts in the subject. And um, so a lot of thought has gone into the plans for hybrid education. And I'll start off by defining what we mean by that term. Um, the, um, what coronavirus has done is accelerate. I'm getting some background noise. So I don't know whether people could mute their microphones. There's some conversation on the line. If people could mute their microphones, that would help. Um, sorry, so I'm just saying that what coronavirus has done is accelerate uh, some of the changes that we needed to make. We've uh, shifted all of our teaching and assessment online very rapidly because we had to send our students home and, and encourage our staff to work from home and close most of our buildings because of the coronavirus pandemic. And so this has accelerated some changes. It's given us some opportunity to learn some lessons. Um, and we think that we're reasonably well placed to try and contribute to the debate about what hybrid education means and how we should provide it. So I'll go to illustrate to you some of those thoughts. Uh, I want to start by thanking some of my colleagues. I hope you can see my mouse moving, but at the bottom of my slide here, um, I'm acknowledging uh, three colleagues, Professor Sean Bain, Joe Art and, and John Turner. These are three colleagues that have been involved in the development of hybrid teaching uh, at the University of Edinburgh going back some years. And Sean Bain is one of the experts on the subject who's published extensively on the topic. And uh, I'm grateful to them in not just for the work that they've done recently, but for the work that they've done going back some time uh, at the University of Edinburgh, including before I arrived. As, as you rightly said in your introduction, I've only been here for two and a half years. Um, so what do we mean by hybrid teaching? Um, these are the core principles, if you like. So first of all, it involves making teaching flexible and making it accessible to students, whether they are on campus or not, and whether they are uh, available, uh, able to access uh, high quality uh, digital technology or not. And we try to provide uh, uh, support to those students that are troubled by what we call digital poverty. In other words, the inability to access either equipment or Wi-Fi or broadband or have time because of other responsibilities, including caring responsibilities. Uh, all of these things uh, impact upon accessibility. Uh, secondly, uh, we want the uh, experience of uh, the University of Edinburgh's education, whether it's online or on campus, to be as high quality as we possibly can. We have uh, over 400 years of history, not, not as old as some Spanish universities, but um, certainly old by British standards. And uh, we are proud of our traditions and we want to maintain their quality as we adapt to modern technology and to external circumstances, including coronavirus. Um, Thirdly, we consider it very important to bring on-campus and off-campus students together. In the past, we would probably have thought about these populations of students as being separate. Um, uh, we have one group of students who are predominantly on campus and then a, another whole group of students that are, that are not and are, are learning at a distance. Increasingly, we think of these two student populations as being one and the same. So because of the requirements for social distancing that we will be operating uh, next semester and probably for some time to come, uh, we will have a hybrid model where some of our delivery is on campus and some of it is not, even to students who are, if you like, in the traditional mode of being on campus students attending the university physically rather than attending as online learners. 
uh, even for those on campus students we anticipate that they will have a hybrid experience with some of the uh, provision being uh, electronic and, and one obvious reason for this is because the model that we used to operate like most large universities of having some teaching delivered by lecturers in very large lecture theatres with hundreds of students present that model is no longer going to be advisable or possible in the face of uh, the public health advice around coronavirus and the need to keep a distance between people. We've calculated that the capacity of uh, our lecture theatres will be reduced very substantially by the need for social distancing. The details depend a bit on how big that distance is. At the moment in Scotland, we're still working under a social distance of two metres. And if you have two metres social distancing, our, our lecture theatre capacity is reduced to uh, something around 10% of the previous levels. Uh, so we won't be able to have very large lecture theatre uh, gatherings. Uh, and then fourthly, very important to us and to, I guess, all universities and all educational establishments of all sorts is this sense of community. We, we're a large university. We have 40,000 uh, on-campus students and a very much larger number online. Uh, uh, it's a big community. It's dispersed across an old city. Many of the buildings that we uh, use are old and um, sometimes unsuitable. Um, uh, we have students living all over the parts of the city as well as uh, uh, commuting into the city and we obviously have the online community. We want to be able to have everybody uh, feel part of the same community and this is a real challenge, uh, has always been and will be even more so uh, with coronavirus and its implications. Um, so that's what we mean by hybrid teaching. The, the um, slogan of the University of Edinburgh uh, is on that slide there. Now it says, influencing the world since 1583. The university was founded in 1583, and that's been the university's slogan in recent years, that we aim to influence the world, and we've been doing so for a long time. The reason for highlighting that is on my next slide, um, where you'll see that at the top of the slide, it says, influencing the world online since 2005. So uh, for approximately the last 15 years, the University of Edinburgh has been aiming to influence uh, in an online way, in the same way that it had done so for 400 years before that, without access to online uh, media. Um, uh, so this uh, slide gives you some details about the university. We have uh, uh, students from 140 different countries. Um, uh, you'll see in this world map here that there's substantial numbers from the UK, from the rest of Europe, from North America. 8% uh, of our students are from Africa uh, and 27% from other parts of the, of the world. Um, the, uh, the, the university has uh, three colleges. The, the largest is the College of um, uh, Arts, Humanities and, and Social Sciences. Um, uh, and then the others are um, uh, Science and Engineering and uh, medicine and veterinary medicine. Uh, this at the center of the slide is a timeline. So I told you 2005 was when we first, uh, long before I arrived at the University of Edinburgh, we had our first online masters uh, launched uh, 15 years ago, one of the earliest ones uh, outside North America. Um, in uh, the subsequent years, uh, we've taken various other steps, including partnering with um, Coursera, FutureLearn and edX, the, the three major uh, providers of online education. We have partnerships with all three of them. Um, in 2017, we had an 85-year-old graduate from one of our online masters, the oldest one so far. Uh, in 2018, we had a thousand studi students graduating from online degrees in that session. And in 2019, last year, we were the first European university to offer both micro-masters and master's programs in partnership with edX. We were an early adopter of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, we now have 53 of them, with a total of two and a half million learners uh, enrolled on those courses. Uh, and as I mentioned, we use all three of the major platforms, edX, Coursera, and FutureLearn. And so far, we've awarded 25,000 uh, certificates uh, for people completing MOOCs. Um, the subject matter of our online programs is very broad across the various different colleges uh, here illustrated in the different colors. Um, you'll see that in the, um, in the graphic at the top right hand side about the 
um, the, which colleges are, are delivering on that education. Uh, although I said that the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences is our largest college physically, which it is, it's not the college which distributes the majority of our online learning. That is medicine and veterinary medicine. 72% of the total are in medicine and veterinary medicine. Um, and then this graph, the last graph at the bottom right hand corner here, illustrates the uh, age distribution of our students. Um, a, a few under 25, the largest group is 25 to 34, but some older, and as I mentioned earlier on, our oldest graduate so far was aged 85. So the point I wanted to make with this slide is that going back 15 years, long before uh, coronavirus and long before everybody uh, started to uh, embrace the idea of hybrid delivery, uh, the University of Edinburgh was building up its capacity and its capability in delivering online education and doing so in a truly international, uh, global uh, sense. And what this enabled for us uh, is to have a firm platform on which to build our plans for hybrid delivery in the next uh, academic year, which is now approaching. So in thinking about hybrid teaching, um, there are these three uh, student groups which uh, my colleague Sean Bain describes as volatile. Um, and the, these groups are the on-campus students who are um, present both in time and space uh, with their teachers. Um, secondly, online students in the same time zone, either uh, in Edinburgh or somewhere else in the same time zone. And thirdly, online students in different time zones. And these three groups of students have some requirements which are the same and some which are different. Uh, and that's what's highlighted on the next couple of slides. So if we think about uh, lectures and how to adapt uh, existing teaching methods for the students on campus, um, if social distancing allows, they can attend physical lectures. But as I've already said, the, the numbers of students that can attend any individual lecture are going to be severely constrained. If the two meter social distance that we currently have goes down to one meter, which it has done in England, but not yet in Scotland, and this is a sort of subtlety of the United Kingdom, which is that education is a devolved activity to Scotland. So Scotland makes its own decisions about education and a number of aspects of social policy. So um, although the UK government in England has already made a decision about the social distancing going to one meter, at the moment we're still operating on two meters in Scotland. So depending on how that might change, that will affect the numbers that can attend a lecture. If students are able to attend a lecture, they can engage in the lecture chat live, or they can use uh, our online discussion forum, which is called Learn, uh, as a, as a real-time interaction with the teacher and with their fellow students. And virtually all of our lectures in Edinburgh are recorded, and so therefore students can access the lecture uh, uh, later, either for a second or third or fourth time if they wish to, or if they missed the original lecture, they can access it for the first time by accessing the lecture recording. The second group of students, the online students in the same time zone, they can attend the lecture at, in real time virtually. So they can watch and engage with the lecture live stream uh, at the same time as it's being delivered physically to those students that are able to attend on campus. And they can engage in a lecture chat uh, in a live way or use learn in the same way that students physically present can do. So for those students, uh, the only difference really is they're not physically in the lecture theatre, but they are able to engage in real time uh, in the same way as students that are physically present. The third category of students is obviously constrained by time zone differences, and it depends on how large the time zone difference is, depending on where they are in the world. These students can watch or listen to a lecture recording if they have the technological uh, access to, to, uh, to do so, so if they have the right equipment and the right bandwidth. Um, some of them may choose to attend the streamed lecture, even if it may not be at a convenient time of day or night for them. Uh, obviously, that's available uh, depending on uh, their willingness to uh, be inconvenienced in terms of time. And they can engage in the discussion using the Learn forums in the same way that other students can, but uh, it's obviously more complicated if you're in a different time zone. Thinking about field trips, another aspect of uh, educational provision. Again, these three students have different, these three groups of students have different uh, requirements. Um, so the students on campus can attend in person, uh, where allowed to do so by, by social distancing and also by travel restrictions. Um, at the moment in uh, Scotland, 
um, uh, we can only make local trips uh, and there are no overnight stays allowed uh, away from the home base. Uh, as long as that continues, then obviously day trips, uh, uh, field trips have to be um, quite limited in terms of the distance involved. Um, students participating in these field trips can create video blogs uh, in the field and they can upload them when they get back or they can broadcast them live to the other groups of students. So there is a, a, a ripple effect of students uh, creating um, a recording of the field trip that, that others can benefit from. The online students in the same time zone um, can engage with those live broadcasts in real time from both the students and the tutors in the field and the tutors can support peer learning and student-led alternatives uh, locally or online um, uh, by, by, uh, by, by participating with these students in the same time zone. Again, more complicated if you're in a different time zone, so students can watch the recordings uh, that have been made by the students in, in their own time at a time that suits them. Um, they can be uh, given uh, set times by tutors based in Edinburgh uh, to have support in either the morning or the evening, whichever is more suitable for their time zone. Um, uh, so that can be well organized, but obviously requires uh, discipline about appointment times and, and whatnot. Um, and they can also engage uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer learning um, via the student-led alternatives in their own local time. Um, uh, but again, uh, that depends on how different their local time zone is from the time in Edinburgh. This um, slide illustrates a building in Edinburgh, which uh, I hope uh, anybody listening will get the chance to come and visit uh, sometime in the next few years. This building is uh, its formerly a hospital. It used to be called the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and it was built in the late 19th century as a state-of-the-art hospital at the time, designed with uh, wings. These, these buildings come sticking forward are wings, which, which used to enclose hospital wards where sick patients would be cared for. And you'll notice there's a big distance between each of these wings. And the reason for that design was to minimize cross infection in a hospital um, along the style of hospital building, which is called uh, the Florence Nightingale style. And um, what we want to use this building for is in a modern sense to promote cross infection. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it was designed to limit cross infection but we want to promote intellectual cross-infection. We've bought this building, which stopped being a hospital about 15 years ago. We're renovating it. The, the exterior of the building is protected, and so we can't change the exterior, but we've changed the interior. We're building some new pieces in between these old wings, and this will be what we call the Edinburgh Futures Institute. This is a multidisciplinary uh, development. Uh, it will involve uh, students and staff from all subject areas of the University of Edinburgh and a lot of its activities will be based around hybrid uh, delivery and we hope that this building will be an iconic um, example of uh, the way the University of Edinburgh is bringing the future to the past if you like. Um, the, there is a rumour that JK Rowling who uh, lives near Edinburgh and wrote the Harry Potter books at least partly in Edinburgh used this building as a model for Hogwarts, the, the castle in Harry Potter. Uh, we don't know whether that's true or not, but it's an interesting anecdote for the, for the story. Um, this building is currently under construction, so it's, it, the work has been suspended during coronavirus because of all construction work being suspended. Um, originally, we were hoping it would open next year. Now it's likely to be the start of 2022 before the building is open. But as I say, everybody listening has an open invitation to come and visit and see this building in its in its true uh, uh, splendor because it's going to be magnificent. It's an enormous building uh, and it's uh, going to be an exciting place, I think, in the future. A lot of the teaching thinking that's going on in relation to the Edinburgh Futures Institute um, is based on interdisciplinarity. Um, it'll be postgraduate more than undergraduate, but there will be some undergraduate teaching as well. The programs are being offered from 2023 onwards when we are confident that the building will be open and functional. Um, all the students will have the option to choose whether to study online or on campus or some mixture of the two. And this will be controlled at both course level and at module level. Every space in the building will have the technology to combine students being physically present or joining uh, online. Um, and so this is an illustration of the, the way in which we're bringing some of our expertise 
to think about future provision. Uh, and um, uh, the colleagues that I referred to at the beginning, including Sean Bain, uh, are leading some of the thinking around the delivery of these educational models, which we think are going to be revolutionary. Um, again, all of this was planned long before coronavirus, but um, we, we hope that part of our response to coronavirus and its implications will be helped by uh, the, the availability of this magnificent facility. So um, I'm coming towards the end of my comments. I want to talk just briefly about some of the ways in which we're sharing um, uh, insights and plans uh, internally in the university with our colleagues and also making them available to the outside world. And a lot of this work is being led by our Institute for Academic Development, IAD, and uh, the other colleagues that I referred to at the beginning, uh, Joe Arton and John Turner, are part of uh, IAD and have been taking the lead on, on this. So we've made available uh, through our um, university uh, intranet um, uh, the, the information about hybrid teaching and, and, and what we're proposing to do. And uh, it's described here as something familiar. So first of all, um, an internal site. Uh, so we, we already have one called Teaching Matters, which is a place where people can uh, highlight novelty or innovative uh, uh, practices and share good practices and learn from one another. Um, and we're going to have a similar site for school and staff uh, to, to learn from others about hybrid teaching as they develop their plans and start to apply them. Um, something new, uh, there's a focus on curating and supporting um, works in progress and new ideas um, with uh, carefully structured information architecture so that um, uh, people can um, uh, collaborate uh, when they see something that interests them uh, in another part of the university. And we've called it something useful um, because the, we believe that this will support the sharing and exchange of insights and ideas and uh, allow people to share experiences as we develop plans, not just for the next academic year, but for academic years to come into the future. This is a learning uh, exercise. Uh, we don't know all the answers. We, we will make some mistakes. We will learn some lessons as time goes on. And it's very important that as a university, we gather all that learning so that we get better and better as time proceeds. The uh, themes of this content uh, are outlined on this slide. So um, there'll be a series of uh, key themes. The, the, the phrase, a learner journey, is very popular in Scotland. This is the, the journey of somebody through school, sometimes through uh, what we call further education, which is uh, sort of technical colleges and university and post-university and lifelong learning. So that the idea is that you don't, you're not only a learner for the time that you're at university, but you're a learner throughout your life, just in various different uh, formats and in various different ways and different places. Um, so that's something that we've uh, embraced within our thinking about hybrid uh, education. Um, we're developing alternative forms of assessment. Obviously, the traditional uh, exam format uh, doesn't lend itself necessarily to online activity, and we're working hard on different ways of providing assessment. And again, we've been forced to do that during coronavirus uh, because all of our assessments moved online for the current cohort of students. Um, but we'd already been thinking about how we should be doing this in the longer term. Um, we're exploring hybrid teaching itself, what it means to different people and what, uh, what experiences they have and, and, and what points they what, what problems they encounter and how they can uh, adjust and adapt and learn from other people's uh, experience. Um, I talked earlier on about building a sense of community. This is very important, but very difficult. And um, belonging to a large community, which is dispersed possibly all over the world and maybe very, very large in terms of total numbers, uh, all living in different circumstances and in different time zones, and in many cases speaking different languages, uh, is a complicated challenge. But we do think that including uh, online students in the community that we've previously thought of in terms of being in Edinburgh is a very important key to success and a key to allowing people to feel that they belong to the university and that they belong to a so supportive uh, um, uh, cosmopolitan community. And uh, issues of equality and diversity. So this is, these are the terms we use to describe issues around gender or race or physical ability or all the other uh, what we call protected characteristics, which is the various different ways of categorizing people. Um, we're very conscious that there are some equality and diversity issues in terms of 
um, economic status, social status, caring responsibilities, parts of the world, whether you're in a rural or an urban setting, uh, various other constraints on people's ability to um, function effectively within a hybrid learning environment. And we try to take those into account in all of our planning. So uh, this is the uh, website that you'd find in uh, the University of Edinburgh looking to uh, explain some of this um, uh, and uh, the various hybrid, the various blog posts which uh, you can find include prototypes. Uh, so some of the models that have already been designed here and elsewhere, um, a strategic perspective on what, what it means to be a hybrid teacher and a hybrid student. Um, some specific perspectives from individual schools or individual deaneries, so different subject areas. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, go back one. Um, apologies. Uh, so different perspectives uh, on hybrid teaching. Um, and just to make the point that it includes very diverse subjects. So engineering, we have a big school of engineering uh, and they're embracing hybrid teaching. We also have a big school of education and sport, which we call Murray House. And Sean Bain, the professor I referred to at the beginning, uh, is a member of the academic staff in the School of Education and Sport. Um, so very diverse subjects uh, are undertaking very similar approaches to hybrid teaching and encouraging collaboration uh, between them. And we're very keen to listen to our students and learn from them. So a lot of the initiatives and a lot of the course content and creation will be student-led. And we've, uh, and Sean and others have undertaken a great deal of work speaking to both current and previous and, and possible future students uh, about uh, their expectations and their ideas. And this has been very productive. And we want to make sure we move between a bit beyond disciplinary silos and really encourage genuine interdisciplinarity because we think that all of the world's major uh, issues can only be solved by interdisciplinary collaboration and we're keen to see that not just in our research but also in our teaching. So um, this is just an example of uh, one of the pieces of content that you can find in this uh, in this uh, web website. Um, it tells you the story of a student called Ewan uh, who's joining the university straight from school. He's from the north of Scotland and he'll be living in university accommodation um, and he's a student on the bachelor's program in Enlightenment Studies. Um, his motivations are described that he's looking forward to moving to Edinburgh and to life at university. His concerns and frustrations, as with many of our new students, uh, he felt that his final year of high school was severely disrupted. We've had a lot of disruption uh, in, in, in Scotland, as, we have in, as you have in Spain, um, uh, by coronavirus and by the effect it's had on people's schooling and on their exams and on their social lives. Um, and Ewan is worried that he may not be academic enough to study at Edinburgh and he's nervous about the step up from school to university. Now, that's not new. I think that's not something that's only happened in a coronavirus year. Uh, everybody, I think, experiences this nervousness as they move from one phase of their life to another. And we know that the move from school to university is a very challenging one for many students. Um, but obviously it's been made much more difficult this year. Um, and then finally his core needs, which he defines as uh, uh, being a, a change of, uh, of, of type of teaching. His teaching at school was really quite traditional. Um, the teacher standing in front of the class and delivering information. And he feels that he needs support with online and hybrid learning and the use of digital technology. So here's an example of an analysis of a typical type of student that might be coming to uh, experience our hybrid learning and some ability for them to say what it is that they're concerned about and, and which particular areas do they think that we need to help them with. Um, uh, this is a bit more about Ewan's experience. So it talks about his lectures, which would um, uh, uh, be uh, not every day, but in, in some days of the week. Um, and he's offered to, to not, he, he can't attend the lectures every week because of the requirement to rotate the number of students that can attend because of social distancing. Um, and then if he doesn't attend physically, he can attend via the live stream. Uh, and of course, as I said earlier on, he has the opportunity to look at the recorded lecture later. In terms of tutorials, which is what we call small group teaching, um, most of his tutorials will take place uh, by electronic means, um, but some will be face-to-face -face depending a little bit on their size. And he and his peers use discussion forums 
to follow up with the tutors and to think more deeply about some of the issues raised in the in the session. Hopefully, as the year goes on, more and more of these tutorials will be able to take place physically on campus and the students can choose to attend physically if they wish, or they can continue to study online if they find that satisfactory or indeed preferable. So there will be some flexibility. And this idea of hybrid, I think also is a dynamic phenomenon. It doesn't, it's not fixed in time. So what start, what's the situation at the start of the term or the start of the academic year may have changed by later in the academic year, depending a little bit on uh, what happens with coronavirus in, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, program level activities, including uh, online advice sessions with uh, our student support team and our personal tutors um, uh, and uh, other activities that are in, in student associations and sports and whatnot are an important element of his experience. And we're trying very hard to make sure that as many of those as possible can still be provided in a socially distanced uh, uh, setting. And then when it comes to exams, uh, alternatives to traditional exams, including what we call open book exams, where the students are given a prolonged period of time, usually 24 hours, sometimes longer, to complete the exam. And so obviously they, they, they can, during that time, have access to uh, the internet and to textbooks and whatnot. So the, the requirements around the exam are very different to the traditional exam. Uh, we're encouraging blogging, we're encouraging production of video reflections and reviews, and these are being developed for all of the courses that Ewan will be undertaking. And so I suppose the question for everybody uh, listening is, what will hybrid teaching mean for your students? Um, Ewan is just one example of an Edinburgh student, but everybody has slightly different needs and wishes. And I think to think what it means for your students and how you need to respond to that is a very important part of the, of the process. So that concludes my remarks. I just have one more slide, which is my take home messages. So uh, these are the points that I hope I've illustrated to you. Um, we are an ancient university, but we were able to adapt very quickly and move all of our teaching and assessment online in less than two weeks. We did this at the end of March, mostly because we were well prepared already and we had good capability in our staff and in our equipment. Um, designing a hybrid model for the next semester and possibly for semesters after that requires much more detailed planning than we were able to do in that first response to coronavirus. It requires investment, it requires experimentation and a willingness to learn and adapt. And the sense that some people have that online education is cheap um, uh, is not true. It requires investment, it requires training of, of staff and of students, uh, and it's a very major undertaking. I think listening to student and staff concerns is vital at every stage. We can learn so much from uh, understanding what people find successful and what they find much more difficult and what particular hurdles they face. So um, throughout the design of this process, including after it starts and, uh, and it starts to be implemented, I think a, a willingness to listen and learn from uh, the, the participants is very important to success. And finally, we have aimed to provide as much certainty as we can uh, in a world which is profoundly uncertain. So we know that our, our students, both our returning students and our new incoming students are very uncertain about what their life will be like uh, next semester, semester, whether they will, how, mu how much of their learning they will have face to face, how much will be online, uh, how much they'll be able to do in terms of sport or social activities or cultural activities. Uh, we just can't really know with any great certainty. What we have been trying to say is that we will be here, we will be providing high quality education in the best way that we can. We will be protecting their health and safety, taking care of uh, equal opportunities, issues, and making sure that anyone who has difficulty uh, functioning in this new world, uh, we will support them as best we can. Uh, and we will respect everybody's wishes and needs to the, to the best of our ability. These are the kinds of things that we've been trying to provide certainty in our communications. But we can't pretend that we really know with any certainty uh, what the precise details of, of uh, life will be like for uh, the students next term uh, and indeed possibly for, for years to come. Um, so at that point, I'm going to stop um, and I'm going to unshare my screen. And if I do this correctly, I'll go back to a different link so that you can see me. Uh, but with, um, uh, well, I'll finish and pass back to you to invite any questions. Okay, thank you so much.
Professor Matheson for your conference. It has been really interesting to, to listen uh, to the uh, experience of the University of Edinburgh, of course, and the reflections about hybrid teaching and learning. Uh, really impressive, this uh, project of the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Uh, congratulations. And uh, as you maybe know, uh, here from Catalonia, we have close relations with uh, almost all the uh, Scottish universities. Uh, so we, we are, you are, you are a, refer a reference institutions for us. Uh, so uh, we have some questions to you. Uh, people is uh, sending us some questions, some comments, reflections to, to you. So we will have uh, more or less a little more than half an hour for, uh, for uh, some specific questions. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, a couple of uh, aspects, first of all, about the international students. You know uh, that uh, especially in the UK, of course, in Scotland, in, in, some, in, in other places like uh, Australia and some other countries, international students are important. So we have, you, you have a lot of uh, uh, graduate students, uh, master students, uh, doctoral students, on uh, coming from other countries so uh, which is uh, your expectations in these uh, hybrid models with the international let's say uh, teaching and learning that could be one question uh, that that it's related with international competitions competition as you know higher education is also let's say a kind of market in some way so uh, universities are, are competing in some way each other in this let's say uh, international markets. So, what's what's your 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 expectations? Your your thinking about that, and uh, in in a, in a time in a, in a time of uh, cooperation as well. What about the international networks? Because we can also have uh, we we have in fact double uh, degrees, uh, academic uh, cooperation, academic programs between different institutions. And what about this this uh, this this experience? connected with high rate education that's that's some let's say conform uh, uh one let's say big question about international uh, students international degrees and so on the second one is about teaching teaching training teacher training so uh i don't know in scotland but here in in catalonia especially in in the whole of spain we have a quite a let's say old uh, uh professor uh, uh uh group uh the average at this moment of some universities are uh, almost 59, 60 years old people. So that's that's uh, sometimes difficult to, let's say, reconvert these professors into uh, online or hybrid uh, models uh, because, you know, they are they were not used to, to use uh, uh, online uh, experience uh, and, and ICT and so on. So that, that could be another question about teacher training and teacher experience on the hybrid models. So uh, if, if you like, uh, I'll, I'll stop here with these two uh, general questions and and then we will have some uh, more time with, the, with with some others. So please. Okay, thank you very much. I, I hope you can see me and, and hear me okay. Um, yes. So uh, uh, just by way of warning, I have a cat that's walking around uh, behind me here. And, and if he, yes. he's very, he might jump in on my keyboard any moment, so don't be alarmed if a big ginger cat jumps up. I'll move so you can see, I'll move this way so you can see him. Yes. yes. So, uh, so thank you for those questions. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of material there. So uh, the first set of questions around international students. So um, we uh, prior to uh, coronavirus, the University of Edinburgh had 43% of its students from uh, outside the UK. So um, we have a very high proportion of international students. The largest single group is from China, um, about four about four thousand Chinese students uh, of our forty one thousand. So about ten percent of our student body is from China, and the second largest group is from uh, North America, particularly the United States, but also Canada. Um, so, uh, and then we have students from a very large number of other countries, including some from Spain and many from other European countries. Um, I have to mention the Brexit word. Um, uh, I apologize for Brexit. I didn't vote for it. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but the British public have decided that we were going to leave the, the EU and we've now done so. 
Um, it looks unfortunately as if the e the UK will not be able to participate in the Erasmus scheme uh, in the longer term. I, I, I regret that. I think it's still possible, but I think it's looking very unlikely. Uh, and also the association with Horizon 2020 and the European Research Council have been very valuable to British universities and actually particularly to Edinburgh. We have a disproportionate amount of support from uh, EU research funding and also um, EU staff and students. So Brexit, even prior to coronavirus, Brexit posed a challenge to us in order to maintain those international links. Um, EU students at the moment can study in Scotland without having to pay tuition fees because the Scottish government underwrites the tuition fees of EU students. Um, after Brexit, we assume that that will change, but we don't know that for sure. And um, we're still talking to Scottish government about that. The UK government for England um, does uh, uh, does charge tuition fees to EU students. So at the most, there's an advantage in terms of cost for us to come to Scotland, but how long that will be maintained. Um, uh, the, um, the, the desire to continue to have these very large groups of international students is very strong in, in me and very strong in my colleagues at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we want to diversify our student intake. We don't want to be unduly dependent on any particular country. Um, but obviously, in terms of population, China is the, the biggest population in the world. And so it's not surprising that we have a lot of international students from, from there. Um, but we don't have very many from India, for example, which is a country almost of similar population size. And some of that is to do with visas uh, and immigration rules in the UK, which the current UK government is changing very favorably. And we're very pleased about that. So it will be, I hope, easier for Indian and other Asian students to come to uh, the UK in the future than it has been in the last few years. Um, so many uh, external factors that we can't control, but we try to influence in terms of our debate with, with government. And a lot of this is around making sure that people believe that the UK is a safe place and a friendly place and a welcoming place. And um, I, I'm biased, of course, but I actually think Scotland is more friendly and more welcoming and safer probably than many other parts of the, the UK. So I would encourage people to think about, uh, about Scotland. Um, in terms of the competitive versus collaborative question, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, universities, as you say, are very competitive organizations. They're competitive within themselves. So individual members of staff compete with one another, students compete with one another, and some, to some extent that's a very healthy phenomenon. Universities are also competitive between other universities in the same country and between other universities internationally. And some of this is 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 led by the league tables and by the uh, desire to outperform some of the, the colleagues. And this is a, a probably a driver of improvement, but it can also become counterproductive. And, and I personally believe that universities should uh, collaborate more than they do, both internally and externally, because I think we're stronger that way. Um, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's helpful to uh, be driven too much by competition rather than by collaboration. Um, and, and in terms of one way in which we're developing that, um, we do have joint and dual degrees with other universities, including universities in Spain. And we do um, encourage these. Obviously, there are sometimes some com complexities around language of instruction and also around timetabling. Um, but we believe that providing a genuine international experience for our students is a very important part of university life. Um, that will be made more difficult for us by Brexit and also by coronavirus, but we remain absolutely committed to trying to make sure that neither of those things uh, limit our ability of our students to have an international experience. In the short term, some of it may need to be electronic rather than um, physical, um, but, the, but, the, but the principle is a very strong one. Um, and one example, just before um, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, a new European network was announced. It's called Una Europa. Uh, there are eight universities in it. There is one from Spain. I, I'm sorry, it's not in Barcelona, it's in Madrid. Um, but there are eight universities in eight different countries speaking eight different languages, and in fact, speaking nine different languages because one of them is the University of Helsinki, and Helsinki is a bilingual university. So there are eight universities in eight countries speaking nine languages. And this network has um, pledged to try and support a single degree 
in a, a number of subjects where students can study the same degree in a different language in a different university and maybe share two or three of these eight universities during their, their undergraduate studies. Uh, this is a pioneering design and a very exciting one. We were planning to do it before coronavirus. Uh, we're still talking about it. It's made a bit more difficult by travel restrictions, um, but actually we're still determined to do this kind of thing. So um, I, I think that kind of collaborative approach is going to be very important for the future. And of course, we're members of uh, a number of other networks as well. We're a member of Liru, we're a member of Universitas 21. Um, and so there are other university networks that we can collaborate with and we can collaborate in a bipartisan way with other universities that are not through networks. So the spirit of collaboration is very strong. Uh, we believe we have a lot to offer people that want to come here, but we also recognize that our people have a great deal to gain from spending time uh, and, and, and learning in other, in, in other, in other settings. Um, I'm happy to pick up any of those points if anybody wants to ask any further questions. On your second point about teacher training, this is extremely important. Um, uh, when I think about this, I, I make two general points. Firstly, um, we do have um, some real expertise in, uh, in teacher training and they, those people are able to provide uh, education and practical experience and training for others. And so um, that's a very important uh, resource, a very important asset. So um, we can teach the teachers, if you like, as well as teaching the students. And that's very important for the future. And we've been running a digital um, uh, education program, which has been put together very quickly in response to coronavirus. And it's had several thousand uh, attendees already. So there's a big appetite in our staff to, to, to learn uh, about some of the new technologies and the way they can be applied. Um, you made the point about some of the older uh, professors who might be a bit less uh, familiar with some of these technologies and perhaps a bit less willing to change when they've been doing something a particular way for many, many years. Um, I, I, the way I think about this is as follows. Um, when you try to change anything, there are always three groups of people. There's one group of people which is uh, very knowledgeable, very enthusiastic and very keen to drive forward change. That group's usually quite small. There's another group of people that will not change under any circumstances, that are resistant to change uh, and uh, probably going to require an enormous amount of effort to get them to, to join in. Hopefully that group is also quite small. The third group is the biggest group, and that's the group in the middle. This is a group of people that are capable of being persuaded or capable of being educated. And the key to delivering change in any university, in any sense, and I've spent the last 20 years of my life trying to deliver change in universities, so I have some experience to speak from. Um, the key is, is converting that middle group into the first group of enthusiasts. The more people in that middle group you can convert and, and persuade and give tools to, the more likely you are to succeed. You probably will never change the small group that doesn't want to change, um, but hopefully they'll be left behind by the scale of uh, the, the, uh, the mobilization of that middle group. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, we also have uh, a general a general comment, uh, comment and, and then two specific questions. Uh, the general comment is, uh, is saying that most of universities are working, are working towards a hybrid model, maybe in the coming years. But some people are saying that the real difference with this, let's say, big group of uh, hybrid universities will be those universities that could offer a really interesting campus, campus experiences, attractive teaching and learning atmosphere, so that are a real attractive, uh, let's say, uh, uh, presential, uh, let's, in a more classical way, experience at campuses. So we could, uh, what, what, what do you think about this? Could we imagine, let's say, almost or a, a really big group of universities coming to the hybrid model? And then the real difference of this, let's say, a first class of really interesting universities with this uh, offering a really a campus, uh, really interesting campus experience and attractive teaching and learning atmosphere. That's a general common or question. And then we also have a, a couple more. One is saying how to establish a link between the university and its community in a hybrid system. It could be related with the, the previous one in some way. And another question about professors. Professors uh, saying at face-to-face -face universities are mainly researchers doing research. What about this interrelation between 
research and teaching and learning in these hybrid models. Sorry for okay, uh, those are really, <laughs> great, questions, really great questions. Um, so, uh, firstly, the comment about um, uh, the fact that many universities will be uh, undertaking hybrid programs and only a subset of those will be the really successful, really uh, high quality um, providers. I, I, I completely agree with that and I'm worried about that because uh, I think previously I would have said that the University of Edinburgh was in a strong position uh, because we could do some things that other people couldn't. Now everybody can do it, everybody's having to do it and so suddenly we lose our advantage. So, so that for me is a concern. Um, I completely agree that the ones that really succeed will be the ones that are able to provide very high quality hybrid uh, education, but also bring something else. And for, for, for places like Edinburgh, uh, we recognize that one of the reasons why we have so many students that want to come to the University of Edinburgh, we have about 10 times as many applicants as we can take. So we have about 10 to one oversubscribed. And the, one of the main reasons for that is the city of Edinburgh. And the, and the country of Scotland. It's a, it's, a, it's a magnificent place to live. It, the air is clean, it's safe, there's beautiful countryside all around, there's hundreds of years of history, uh, and the main thing is that the city is very small. Um, it's a capital city, it has a parliament and it has consulates and a major international airport, etc. but it only has half a million people. And so it's a small city, you can walk around, you can enjoy the city. So um, we're working very hard to try and think how can students still experience the all the positive things about about edinburgh and about scotland um, during the time when their actual learning process may be very different um, and that sort of relates to the first question about the the links with the community because there is no part of society that's not affected by social distancing and by public health advice i mean for us for example public transport you know buses and trains uh, are going to be very severely affected. Now, fortunately, the size of Edinburgh and the location of our buildings means that quite a lot of people can walk or bicycle uh, between the, uh, the the different locations. But we have to think about that in terms of our timetabling. We have to allow them time to, to take a bit longer to travel between one site and another than previously they'd have been able to if they were getting a bus or a, or a taxi or a car. Um, but but the, every part of society is affected. I mean, in Edinburgh, one of the major activities of the year is the Edinburgh International Festival, where the biggest arts festival in the world, where thousands of people come uh, in July and August to attend either the festival or the fringe. And that's been canceled this year because of coronavirus. So uh, that's a very serious blow for the city. And we've been talking to the city council, we've been talking to the festival organizers about how can we salvage something from that wreckage? How can we make sure that um, some activities still happen. So the, the International Book Festival, which is one of the components of the Edinburgh International Festival, is going to be providing an online uh, festival with online interviews with authors and with online opportunities to do some of the things that you could normally do at the Book Festival. And we're doing that jointly with them. So the university is joining as a partner in the online Book Festival. So I think all, the, all of these are examples of, uh, uh, of what we're calling adaptation. We haven't been talking about recovery because recovery sort of implies that you go back to the previous ways of doing things we don't think we will ever go back to the old ways uh, we're talking more about adaptation to a new world uh, and, and a lot of this will require uh, collaboration with uh, with business with cultural organizations with governments and with uh, with with uh, elected councils and whatnot um, so i think that's very important it's always been a very important um, but it's even more important as we adapt to coronavirus uh, the University of Edinburgh was the first university in the UK uh, to be founded by the city, not by the church. So we are the original civic university in the UK and, uh, and we're very proud of that and we think it's a very important aspect of our future. So I quite agree with, the, both, with both the comment and the question about the importance of, of, of that. Um, and then the, the, the last question, which was about the interaction between research and teaching. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Um, I regard myself as predominantly a researcher. That's what I started doing. As you said at the beginning, my background is in medicine uh, and I spent years of my life in a laboratory with test tubes and cells and molecular biology and whatnot. Um, then when I um, uh, start looking at what I've done in my career, which has given me the most satisfaction, I would say that in many ways it's been the teaching that's given me the most satisfaction. Um, I, I, um, 
I, I, I've never uh, carried an enormous teaching load because my particular subject within medicine is quite a specialist subject, but I really enjoy the teaching that I've done. And in more recent years, I've spent time teaching in Africa, particularly in Uganda, uh, and I've really found that a very fulfilling uh, experience. So I'm predominantly a researcher, but actually I've found a great deal of gratification in teaching. Um, and I don't, um, I don't welcome the idea that teaching and research are somehow in competition. Uh, I think they have to be done in alignment. I think in many cases, uh, there are some people that are really very well suited to research and not particularly well suited to teaching. There are some people that are very well suited to teaching but not to research. And then there are many, many people that can do both uh, very effectively. And so I think um, we, we, we must uh, promote excellence in both teaching and research. We must recognize that in order to run a successful university, you need both. Uh, and they, they must not be in competition with one another. I don't like the idea that you have to choose either to favor teaching or research. Um, some of the um, uh, attraction to students to go to one of our universities is the knowledge that they'll be uh, meeting with and being taught by uh, famous researchers. Now, those won't necessarily always be the best teachers, but I think they should be included in some of the teaching uh, because they have uh, a, a great deal to offer. Um, so I think recognizing that the, the university requires lots of different skills, some of them much more teaching orientated, some of them much more research orientated, uh, and there should be mutual respect for, for both, uh, I think is very important. And the final thing I'd say on it is that I think the, um, uh, you can see my cat in the background now, so I'm worried he's going to knock that vase over. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the other thing that, that universities have to do, and they haven't done terribly successfully in the past, is that they have to... Uh, reward excellence in teaching. We're very good at rewarding excellence in research. We're very, it's very easy for us to measure uh, uh, citation indices or grant income or other indices of research achievement. It's much more difficult to measure excellence in teaching and we need to do that better. We need to reward it. We need to promote people on the basis of their teaching excellence and we need to make sure that uh, the teaching contributions that people can make are, are recognized and prized in the same way that, 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 that research has always been. Thank you very much. Uh, we are also looking to your cat, which is <laughs> trying to rest to rest a bit <laughs> behind you. We we also have some uh, a couple of questions more. And uh, first of all, I absolutely agree with your uh, uh, your uh, common comment about the quality of life of uh, Edinburgh of, or, or the uh, of the old uh, Scotland with this facing fascinating cultural atmosphere and, uh, and it's really this uh, size of, of the city, the size of, uh, I would say, Scotland, it's, it's, it's so attractive. I, I'm, I was thinking again uh, also in, uh, in our case in Catalonia, which, which also we have, of course, we also have Barcelona as an attractive uh, international city, but we also have some other, let's say, middle-sized uh, cities, university cities, like Girona, Lleida, yeah. or, Tar or Tarragona, that uh, also offers this, let's say, uh, atmosphere for for uh, for a nice student experience, uh, as as well as Barcelona. Uh, um, we still have a couple of questions more. One is saying there are those who believe that the key to quality learning in the future will be the ability to generate, let's say, individual learning, in the individualized learning. Do you agree with this this assessment? And uh, what do you think if we relate this uh, individualized uh, learning with uh, uh, hybrid systems? That's one. And the other one is saying, do you think that the hybrid learning model can facilitate lifelong learning or the other around? So what's, that's the relation with uh, lifelong learning that you were referring in your in your mm -hmm. previous conference. Thank you. Okay, the, the, the second question is easier than the first, so I'll take the second question first. Um, uh, so can uh, hybrid learning facilitate lifelong learning? I think the answer is absolutely yes, um, but I think it's got to be um, prioritized. I think at the moment we tend to think, in, certainly in the UK, we tend to think about most university students being young and most of them being uh, pre prior to entry into the employment market. So they come from school, they may take a year or something, but then they come to university. That is the standard model. And I don't think that will necessarily always be the standard model. I think we uh, we will see, especially with the advent of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, some of the new 
um, uh, uh, technological capability, uh, we will see that old jobs disappear and old skills become redundant. And so universities need to be places where new skills can be provided and, and people later in life can come back. So I do think that a lot of that will be facilitated by hybrid learning because a lot of those older people will be working part time or they may have caring responsibilities or they may have other other ways in which they can't attend a traditional full time uh, course. Um, I give you one example. So the when I worked in Hong Kong, I was very impressed by uh, the National University of Singapore. So there's a lot of rivalry between Hong Kong and Singapore, but quite often Hong Kong looks at Singapore as a as a way of seeing uh, some really good ways of doing things. And the National University of Singapore, um, some years ago now, about three or four years ago, introduced a guarantee that any one of their students could come back, um, I think it's for 20 years, for 20 years after they graduate, they have a guarantee that they could come back to the university and study something different if they wanted to. Not necessarily for a degree, but for a, for a new skill or a new qualification. And that scheme was supported by the, the Singapore government, which uh, invests very heavily in education. So um, I thought that was a great idea. I tried to encourage people in Hong Kong to think about that. I didn't make much progress. And I tried to encourage people here to think in the same way. And I haven't made much progress here because it's expensive and it's, a, and it's complicated to arrange. But I think this idea that um, universities should be educating more than just the traditional school lever, uh, young person, I think is very much the case. And I do think that hybrid learning will, will help that. But it, for me, what needs to change is, is something about the, the philosophy of universities and the idea that we should be thinking about education more as a lifelong phenomenon. Um, the first question about individualized learning, I mean, I'm not an expert on that subject and I would need to ask my colleagues for advice about the answer to that. Um, I, I don't think really I don't think a hybrid learning approach necessarily is any more likely to be individualized than a, than a traditional face to face approach. I think um, we do need to understand that everyone is different and everyone's needs are different. Everyone starts from a different place um, and everyone maybe has different plans or different intentions. So I think the ability to have um, some flexibility, some individualization of any teaching program is, a, is an important one. Um, I don't know that uh, hybrid learning is any better able to do that than any other form of learning because I think it requires uh, uh, flexibility both on the part of the teacher and on the part of the, the learner. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, there's a could be a, the final a final comment that, that or question uh, for you uh, would be about the disciplines. Uh, what about the disciplines and the hybrid uh, models? Do you think all subjects, all disciplines could be converted into hybrid uh, uh, teaching and learning atmospheres or models? Or there is substantial differences, maybe about uh, applied science uh, uh, subjects, more these, let's say more, more connected with uh, physical infrastructures or laboratories or, or medicine, as you, as you know very well, or, or not, or there is everything, every subject, every discipline could be converted uh, uh, to the to this hybrid model. What do you think about, the, about that? Um, so uh, again, it's a really good question and, and, and a difficult one to answer in a very short time. But I would say, firstly, I think in principle, every discipline can uh, adopt hybrid approaches. I don't see there's any reason why anybody should be completely immune from this thinking. Um, but of course, there are some very important practical difficulties. So if you if you require laboratory experience and, and you know, the physical sciences or chemistry or biology, um, it's it's difficult to do all of that virtually. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, uh, within medicine, my own subject, um, a lot of the education and training requires physical interaction with other human beings. Of course it does. That's the basis of the profession. And so anything which makes that more difficult is going to be a challenge. But a lot can be done with simulation. A lot can be done with uh, with uh, phantom uh, uh, models uh, and and with uh, uh, video and, and and whatnot and other formats. So so I think every discipline should, in in theory, be able to adopt it. But there will be some very significant practical differences. And if again, if I give you one example, um, in Scotland at the moment, we're having a big debate about dental dental education. So teeth dentists, people who uh, like my wife uh, is a dentist, and and um, uh, the the requirement for dentistry is that you have to have a lot of practical experience before you're signed off as being competent to graduate. And um, because of coronavirus, a lot of uh, dental procedures, which involve the generation of aerosols from the mouth, which could transmit infection, 
a lot of them are going to be impossible. And so we're having a big debate about how can we possibly provide proper dental education to our, to our dental students, but do it safely uh, and do it in requirement, in, in recognition of the guidelines. And so there's an example of uh, a subject where coronavirus has had a really major impact on our ability to teach. And a lot of that can't be done virtually. It's got to be done practically uh, with practical day-to-day -day experience supervised in the in the, in the appropriate way and done in, a, in an atmosphere of, of safety. So there are some really significant practical challenges, but the, the philosophy I believe should be that every discipline can uh, make efforts to provide some degree of hybrid uh, delivery. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we still have five minutes. Uh, so if, if you don't mind, we can go for a last yeah, one. I'm already, yeah, I'm already making my next meeting, but I can take <laughs> one more. Okay, thanks a lot. So the last question is saying, how do you, your university organize the teaching workforce in order to be able to attend and help campus students and off campus students? You mentioned before a little bit in, in your in your conference, but uh, that, that questions ask, ask you for let's let's more talk about it, please. Yes. Okay, so I must comment that your your uh, attendees are all asking extremely good questions. I, I, I'm very impressed by uh, the fact that people are thinking about the the issues, and and that's that's really helpful for me as well. Um, so um, the organisation of the workforce is a really important topic, and again, we, we we've been discussing this a lot, and I, I don't think we have all the answers, but we're trying to think these things through. Um, the 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 last few months have required people to work extremely hard, and often to work in very difficult circumstances. And so a lot of my colleagues are very tired. A lot of them are very frustrated. A lot of them feel that life has been very difficult recently. And, and of course, there are, many of them are concerned about their health or the, or the health of their, their loved ones. Um, so uh, these have been very difficult few months. And then on top of that, we're now asking people to work even different, even more differently, even harder, even, even more flexibly in the months to come. And so there is a question of um, wanting to be sympathetic to people's morale and to their uh, stamina and to their their ability to carry on doing uh, all these extra things. Um, if we have to have a socially distanced uh, uh, teaching environment uh, of two meters apart, then we can't deliver the teaching that we want to deliver in the standard working week, nine to five, whatever the daytime is. We've talked about extending into the evenings, and we've talked about using Saturday as a as an additional teaching day. Um, you can imagine this is very unpopular um, uh, because staff don't want to give up their evenings or give up their their, their weekends. Um, but what we've been advocating is some form of shift working, whereby sometimes people will work in an evening and sometimes they'll work in a daytime. Sometimes they'll work on a Saturday, sometimes they'll work on a Friday in order to stagger the, the teaching provision. If the social distancing guidelines are relaxed a bit and, and it becomes one meter or 1.5 meters, then we probably won't need to teach on Saturdays. Um, we may not need to teach every evening. So um, again, we're we're modelling the different approaches, but there is no question that the that the working environment for our teachers is going to be radically changed by um, by coronavirus. And I suppose the, the the final point I'd make is that we've spent a lot of time thinking about attitudes of students and what students are worried about, and will the international students still come, and all these kinds of things. But actually, increasingly, I'm of the opinion that the students are less concerned about uh, coronavirus than maybe the staff. Uh, the students are young generally and we know that young people are much less susceptible to the virus the students are also more likely to be risk-taking and to be wanting to prioritize other activities and actually we have to really pay attention to the worries of our staff we know that our staff are older we know that they may have uh, health issues themselves or their loved ones do and we know that they're concerned about their implications for their own health of having to meet with and teach very large numbers of students in a short time, sometimes in very confined spaces. So we're, we're paying a lot of attention to thinking about staff concerns because we recognize that we've already pushed our staff very hard and made many demands upon them. And, uh, we're, and we're continuing to do that. And, and we have to be um, uh, respectful of their, of their needs and their wishes. And I think staff uh, welfare is probably as big an issue for us as, as student welfare. Thank you very much. I absolutely agree with with your comments. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Peter Matheson, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. 
it has been a, a pleasure uh, uh, to listen to your inspiring conference and uh, your uh, interesting dialogue. Again, uh, thanks so much from the FIDUI uh, International Congress. It has been an honor to, to host you uh, for this conference today. It's my pleasure to participate. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the superb technical organization because this is not straightforward to organize these things uh, and the technicalities have worked yeah. very well for me. Um, I wish you best of luck for the rest of your conference and I hope that you'll come and visit Edinburgh before long and I hope I can visit uh, Catalonia. But, but um, um, uh, I, uh, I don't know when we'll be able to travel and when we'll be able to meet in more normal circumstances, but it's my pleasure to contribute to part of your conference and, uh, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, see you soon, of sure, in, in Edinburgh or in, or in Catalonia. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Yeah, so, right, take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. And just a final uh, reminder to tomorrow, uh, as you know, tomorrow we will have a second session and a dialogue about the evolution of the student-teacher binomial in the new context with uh, Linda Castañeda from the Universidad de Murcia and Hugo Pardo from Outliers School, moderated by, by Josep Joan Moreso from the Catalan University Quality Assurance Agency. Muchas gracias a todos, a todas y a todos por la vuestra atención. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por vuestra presencia hoy en este simposium virtual de Cidui. Uh, and vayamos demá. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much.